Hi, and welcome to the Olympus Symposium session of the BAFS Annual Conference 2020. Over the next 45 minutes, we'll introduce you to two innovative products from Olympus which are genuinely changing the game in neurology. Up first, we have Mr. Neil Barber, who is a consultant neurologist at the Friendly Benign Prostate Clinical Research Centre. Neil will discuss ITIND and the future of surgical management of BPH. I'd like to thank Olympus for the kind invitation to speak today in the symposium at BAUS 2020. My name is Neil Barber. I'm a urologist at Frimley Park Hospital, part of Frimley Health NHS Foundation Trust, based in Surrey and Berkshire. I'm talking today about the temporary implantable nitinol device known as ITIND. 2020 uh, has seen the emergence over the last few years of so-called minimally invasive surgical treatment options as alternatives to the standard cavitating procedures of TURP and the lasers in the treatment of uh, symptomatic benign prostate disease. The first of these so-called minimally invasive surgical treatments or MISTs was Eurolift. And since then, we've seen the arrival of prostatic artery embolization and of Resume. And the ITIND falls in this category along with these other options. The second generation of the ITIND device is therefore a treatment aimed in uh, relieving lonely tract symptoms secondary to benign prostatic hyperplasia. It is a device that is placed in the prostatic urethra for five to seven days in an ambulatory manner. It is made up of three pressure struts that create longitudinal ischemic incisions, remodeling the bladder neck and the prostatic urethra with the aim of relieving obstruction, improving urinary flow and improving bothersome lonely tract symptoms. The three nitinol cutting struts are at 12, 5 and 7 o'clock and the device is also made up of an anchoring leaflet seen at 6 o'clock which is used to position the device and prevent migration during the period of treatment. At the end of that treatment period a polyester suture which is anchored to the distal part of the device is used for retrieval. The three nitinol cutting struts therefore create longitudinal incisions by pressure necrosis at the 12, 5 and 7 o'clock positions, much like a Mercedes Benz. And one can see images here of those incisions through the prostate. This mixture of real life video and animation hopefully demonstrates the process of both insertion and removal, but particularly reinforces that this is truly a minimally invasive surgical treatment option, quick to deliver, easy to learn and reproducible in its effects. Under sedation, and we use a mixture of propofol and fentanyl infusion, a standard cystoscope is delivered through the urethra, the prostate and into the bladder. The cystoscope sheath needs to have a minimum diameter of 19 French. This examination allows confirmation that the prostate is of a suitable shape and also the ability to exclude any other pathology, be it in the urethra or the bladder. Once the bladder is emptied, the telescope itself can be removed, leaving the sheath in place. Using an introducer sheath, the device is then fed through the cystoscope sheath into the bladder. The guide wire is moved forward until one feels the device free within the bladder itself. Once this is done, the introducer sheath is removed, the cystoscope sheath removed over the guide wire, the cystoscope itself reassembled and passed back down the urethra alongside the guide wire into the bladder. This allows direct visualization of the device within the bladder. And this is important as at this stage, the guide wire can be used then to rotate the device such that the anchoring leaflet is in the correct position at six o'clock.
Once this has confidently been achieved, the device can thereafter be retracted over the bladder neck into the prostatic urethra under direct vision. It is important to make sure that one has done this properly to ensure good positioning and that there will not be no migration of the device during the treatment period. And we can see here the anchoring leaflet slip over the bladder neck into a good position. Once the surgeon is happy with that, the cystoscope is simply removed. One then either loosens the slip knot or cuts the end of the guide wire, which allows it to be slipped over the retrieval suture. The retrieval suture is looped and taped to the penis for use when the patient returns for retrieval in five to seven days. During that period of time, the torque within the device pushes out in the 12, 5 and 7 o'clock positions along the struts to create the longitudinal incisions through the bladder neck and prostate. On returning, uh, the retrieval suture is fed through a snare, which itself is fed through a 22 French open-ended catheter. The snare used to pull the suture through that catheter, such that the catheter can be railroaded over the suture, down the urethra and towards the device. It's important to keep the retrieval suture taut at this time, such that the catheter engages correctly with the end of the device. And once this is the case, the device itself can be pulled and collapsed within the catheter, ensuring a traumatic removal. Subsequent endoscopic examination demonstrates the three longitudinal incisions made through the bladder neck and the prostatic urethra, and how this opens up an occlusive prostate with the aim of relieving obstruction and improving symptoms. In 2018, the data as was was submitted to the Interventional Procedures Committee of NICE. Guidance from that committee was published in January 2019, stating at that point in time that the data set meant that the procedure should only be used in the context, context of research. The committee required further data, both short and long term in terms of outcomes, information regarding reintervention rates, and outcomes in terms of impact upon sexual function by more established methods. Roll on then to 2020, what data do we have available regarding the outcomes of ITIN in the treatment of symptomatic BPH? There are three main studies that have now been published in peer-reviewed journals. You can see that the patients included in those studies had moderate to severe, to severe symptoms, poor flow rate suggested of bladder outlet obstruction, but also relatively small prostates with volumes largely less than 40 mils on average included in those studies. Exclusion criteria um, were the usual kind that one sees in BPH studies, but note that median lows with an IPAP of greater than one centimeter were also excluded. MT01 was an initial study published using the first generation device. This from, was from a single centre in Turin under the uh, guidance of Professor Paul Pelia. This uh, study demonstrated uh, the significant improvement in IPSS and maximum flow rate that one would hope to see from any surgical treatment for symptomatic BPH and suggested that this improvement is maintained out to three years. MTO2, which was the next step in its evaluation, was a multi-centred, uh, largely European study with a single site in Hong Kong, as well as seven sites in Europe. 81 patients were included in this study with a mean age of 60 years and a mean prostate volume of just under 40 mils. The procedure was performed under light sedation. Patients were in and out of hospital within hours 
and describe little discomfort needing minimal analgesia. Five to seven days later, the device was removed under topical analgesia in an ambulatory setting. And again, patients described little discomfort. Recently published is the three-year outcome data from this multi-centered trial, once again demonstrating significant improvement in IPS and maximum flow rate, as well as most importantly, quality of life scores, and also uh, improvements in bladder emptying. Effect on sexual function was only assessed using yes-no questionnaires, but no patients in that study described any new uh, or indeed any ejaculatory dysfunction nor indeed any issues regarding erections. The most common complications were low grade and largely relating to the presence of the device itself being hematuria, urgency, pain and dysuria. No late complications occurred. A failure analysis was carried out looking at these 81 patients. Of the 12 patients who were deemed to have failed treatment, 60% of them had significant middle lobes and intraprostatic protrusion. No other preoperative variables were found to predict poor response to the ITIN treatment. It is therefore reasonable to conclude that men with significant middle lobe elements are not the best candidates for this device. The third study, MTO6, is another multi-centered European study. Thus far, interim analysis of data at six months has been published in peer-reviewed literature. The device uh, was delivered and the patient group the same as previous studies. On this occasion, more standardized uh, questionnaires were used in terms of evaluating outcome, uh, looking at impact upon sexual function. 70 patients were enrolled. And what is interesting that we're already seeing that uh, ITIN really does represent a minimally invasive surgical treatment Patients describing a return to daily life uh, in a mean of four days following removal of the device. Again, in this study, uh, and using more standard questionnaires, no impact upon sexual function, be it ejaculatory or erectile, was noted or recorded. Once again, at six months, we are seeing a significant improvement in IPSS and quality of life. If we then overlay the outcomes from these three studies published so far, one sees a reproducibility of that outcome, both in terms of symptom improvement and flow rate improvement. The final study is the MTO3 study. This is the study required by the FDA for any of the minimally invasive surgical treatments uh, for symptomatic BPH and replicates the pool study for Eurolift and the pivotal study for Resume. This was a multi-site study in the US and 185 patients were recruited and randomized against SHAM. Although the data from this study is yet to be published in peer-reviewed journal, the data has been reviewed by the FDA and in February of this year, uh, the FDA granted de novo classification for ITIN as treatment for symptomatic BPH. So what can we conclude? ITIN is a truly minimally invasive surgical treatment for men with symptomatic BPH. It is quick to perform under sedation and retrieved under local anesthesia. There is a rapid improvement in symptoms and return to normal activity. And the data suggests that, that this improvement in symptoms is reproducible and durable. And the level of symptom improvement and flow improvement is comparable to the other so-called minimally invasive surgical treatments of Eurolift and Resume. These improvements in symptoms of flow seem to be achieved with a, no apparent risk to sexual function, be it ejaculatory or erectile. By the end of 2020, uh, we hope to see the publication of MTO3, and that means the data set on, over, on some 400 patients included in trials across the globe uh, for ITIN under clinical study. With this under their belt, uh, one would assume uh, that uh, Olympus and Meditate will return to NICE, be it uh, to the Interventional Procedures Committee or to the Medical Technology Evaluation Programme uh, for further evaluation uh, and improved guidance. Thank you very much. Up next, we will hear a recording from Dmitry Inigev from Sechenov University, Russia. 
Dimitri will discuss assaultive and its capabilities for unblock resection of NMIBCs. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, greeting from Moscow, from Russia, from Sechenov University. Uh, my name is Dmitry Yenikev, and today we would like to discuss new technology, uh, thulium fiber laser, and I will focus on bladder cancer surgery. So, bladder cancer is among top 10 most frequent cancers in the world. At the same time, 75% of all bladder cancers are non-muscle invasive. It's very interesting to look at the guidelines, European guidelines, over the, and to see the changes over the last four years. Uh, in 2016, EU recommended transuterine resection as the main treatment option for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. In 2017, they kept this recommendation but added unblock as a possible option. And in 2018, unblock joined transuterine resection as first-line treatment and stayed there in 2020. The reason for such changes in the guidelines was critical importance of muscle on pathology. If muscle is absent, repeat transuterine resection is necessary. Unblock uh, translates from French into all at once. It includes uh, the tumor itself uh, plus surrounding mucosa with 5 to 10 millimeter margin and muscle layer. Simultaneous resection of these parts should allow us to decrease uh, the reimplantation rate and provide clear, clearly defined surg surgical margins. For a long time, transuterine resection has been the gold standard for non-muscle invasive. At the same time, uh, unblock is rather quickly becoming popular and uh, there was a very interesting article published in Giendo some time ago uh, of over 200 urologists polled, uh, more than a third answered that they use unblock whenever possible, and only 12% never, never use this technique. Different energy sources are possible to use for unblock resection, uh, electrosurgery, mono and bipolar, and different lasers, holmium yak and thulium yak, and according to study published by Donna Hansel in European Urology, electric energy may damage the sample and no detrusor will be seen on morphology. But at the same time, there are also other opinions. For example, Dr. Kramer and Dr. Herman are sure that both options are safe and have comparable oncological outcomes. And like with endoscopic enucleation of the prostate, energy source is secondary. However, is it really so? The obturator nerve reflex can be a serious problem during electrosurgery, even causing perforation, but not during laser resection. Uh, terrible, terrible video, nightmare of urologists. Uh, we at Sechenov University started our M block experience with Holmium Yak laser. However, during Holmium, using Holmium laser, we found out that the incision quality and hemostasis were by no means bad, but we were not satisfied with them. And we wish for something more precise, something more effective, something more delicate. And for that reason, we started collaborating with IPG company. It's one of the leaders in laser technology. And our aim was to develop a, a new device uh, that would meet all the needs of, uh, of urologists. And uh, to achieve that goal, we organized a laser lab, uh, technology laser lab in our university, here it is. And as a result uh, of this collaboration, uh, now we have a new thulium fiber laser. So on the left picture, you, uh, on the left side, you may, you may, there is a uh, version for Russian market by IPG and it was approved in Russia uh, in 2016. And the right model is for the world market produced by Olympus. A few words about this technology. One of its key properties is its wavelength. It is 1.94 micrometers and it matches the peak of water absorption, which is the major tissue component that absorbs laser energy. So, for example, the Holmium Yaks and Thulium Thulum Yax lasers wavelengths 
are significantly off the peak. Currently in Russia, there are two models of thulium fiber laser. The first one is device with peak power of 100 watts. It works in pulse quasi-continuous mode and has excellent cutting properties. The second one is a super pulse laser with a peak power of 500 watts and average power of 40 watts. So this device works in super pulse mode and it is perfect for lithotripsy. At the same time, its cutting properties are comparable with those of Holmium. To understand this technology, it is better to compare it with well-known Holmium, Holmium device. So the Holmium Yak device combines output of several flash lamp pump Holmium Yak crystal lasers into one surgical fiber. As for the Thulium fiber laser, it is different in this regard. It uses about 30 meters of active Thulium fiber pumped by a small diet laser as a laser source. Another important difference of this technology is its energy efficiency, which translates into two things. First, you don't need any special adapters. You can just plug it into the wall. Second, Thulium fiber laser uses air cooling in contrast to all other systems that use water cooling. All this makes it lighter and more compact. And what is also very important, it is much quieter than solid state lasers. Here, here they are. So in our lab, in Session of University, we performed an in, an in vitro study and compared it with Holmium laser and found optimal settings for bladder surgery energy 1 joule and average power 10 watts so and in contrast it's very important in contrast to thulum yak laser it allows us to decrease carbonization due to its pulse mode of operation so a picture is worth a thousand words let's see it uh, 1 joule 10 watts these settings now we use for effective tissue cutting with excellent hemostatic effect and no carbonization Usually, the surgery starts with a circle incision around the tumor. The incision is made at about 5 to 7 millimeters away from the tumor. It is continued deeper until the muscle layer is visible. You may see that there are no bleeding vessels and hemostasis is almost perfect. After we complete the circle incision, it is possible then to go under the tumor. As you can see, the laser allows for making precise and effective incisions without burning the tissue so that all the layers are clearly visible and also you may see that the how delicately the laser separates muscle, muscle fibers <laughs> and of course who is especially satisfied with this technology is our pathologist and you may see that the laser effect on tissue at the coagulation zone are minimal Usually unblock is recommended for tumors less than 3 cm because larger tumors are difficult to remove through the, through the resectoscope. However, now uh, a lot of companies working on the issue of tumor extraction. And here are currently available options. Uh, Alex Evacuator uh, or Janice Syringe. Someone use uh, laparoscopic grasp. Someone use endobag. And... We at Session of University, we mostly use morcellation and uh, contrary to what it seems, we do not violate the key principles of Unblock. So, uh, yes, at first we perform superficial resection up to the submucosa. It allows us to separate the exophytic part of the tumor from its base. And then we uh, use... Here it is. And then we use marcellation, marcellate the tumor. As it's rather soft, it usually takes 5 to 10 seconds. And then we perform unblock resection up to the deep muscle layer. And this material we also separately send to morphologists and have a rather good staging. The material from marcellator we also send to morphologists and from that material we have very good grading. Of tumor. 
Another advantage of Thule fiber laser is that it allows for precise separation of the orifice and the tumor when they are close to each other without injuring the ureter. Using laser energy, we can delicately avoid the orifice. In some cases, the orifice can be involved into the tumor. Then it is possible to perform the usual unblock. However, to prevent the possible ureter stenosis, we stand it at the end of the surgery. So here is the final step, and here is the stenting. So th these techniques were presented at AA meeting in 2018. It was uh, awarded best video of the session. And at the same time, uh, this year at Virtual European Congress, our video took third place. So uh, our first experience with this technology, which is uh, going to be soon published in Bladder Cancer Journal, showed that thulin fiber and block resection provides better relapse free rate at six months and better detrusor detection rate. Summing up, thulin fiber laser is a novel, novel device with proven high efficacy uh, and safety profiles and what is just as important in bladder cancer surgery, it offers good material for pathologists. So thank you for your thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now we will hear a recording from Mr. Ben Chu, who is an associate professor of urological sciences at University of British Columbia, Canada. Ben will discuss saltive and its fine dusting capabilities for flexible ureteroscopy. Thank you for joining us. Today I will be talking about the thulium fiber laser saltive system for fine dusting for flexible ureteroscopy. I'm from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Some of my disclosures that are pertinent to this particular talk are the fact that I do consulting for another Johnson & Johnson uh, company as well as for Olympus Medical, so please keep that in mind as we go along. One of the things I'd like to point out is that uh, myself, Dr. Bodo Knudsen and Dr. Um, Wilson Molina have done extensive bench testing of the salt of laser versus the luminous P120. And what we found that at fragmenting settings, the salt of laser is actually more efficient in terms of milligrams per second than the P120 in terms of fragmenting and breaking up one cubic millimeter bagel stones excuse me, one centimeter cubic bagel stones. And when you put them to dusting settings, even compared to the Moses setting, we found that it's actually been faster using the salt of laser than using the P120. What we've also found is that when you take the P120 and measure the amount of fragments that come out afterwards, the yellow ones here tell you that these pieces are greater than two millimeters. And what you'll find that the blue is less than 0.5 millimeters is that there's just a lot more dust when you use the salt of system. This kind of fine silty dust that you see over here. And this is the kind of dust that we want to see when we're doing dusting because we want these pieces to be easy to pass. Now, what is this translated to? Even if we use it in the fragmentation settings, what we found is that on average, and this is the weight of these pieces, there's a larger weight in these two pieces on average for the salt of laser versus this whole weight here, which measures into 7.2 fragments. So what this means clinically perhaps is if you are a fragmenter and a basketer, when you use the salt of laser, you only get two fragments versus seven if you're using the P120. So clinically, this may translate to the, the fact that you would actually require less passes with the basket. So if this is only two pieces, but this is seven, what's happening to the rest? Well, the rest is actually going to dust. So this laser is more of a dusting laser. And even if you do get fragments you wanna basket out, they're actually gonna be fewer. So this will be helpful, I think, for both dusters and for basketers. Now, what about retropulsion? This is one of the things I find really nice about this laser is that you don't get very much retropulsion from it. What we find here, from the luminous laser, these are the energies you get per, uh, uh, per, per pulse when you hit the stone. If you look at the salt of laser, it's actually very equivalent to Moses when you're in the dusting mode. However, as you know, you don't use Moses for the fragmenting setting. And what you find is that the 
retropulsion impulse is much, much lower using the salt of laser. So what this means is that the stone is just not going to move around as much. These are the two models that are available. This is the pro model and this is the premium model. And this is the model that we have. This one has a nice touch screen and it goes up to 2400 hertz. This one goes up to four joules and 100 hertz, whereas this one goes up to six joules. So I just want to show you a few things here. When you go up to the settings here, you can actually change them. And actually you can have two different foot pedals one on the left side and one on the right side, depending on what you want to do. So you can turn it to dusting and you can have one set at 0.1 and 30 hertz, for instance. And then we can go to the lowest setting of 0.025 joules and then a maximum of 2,400 hertz for 60 watts. Now you can only deliver this at the longest pulse width. And there are three pulse widths. There's the shortest, the medium, and then the long pulse width. And with that, you can have two different foot pedals and you can, you can basically decide what you need to do uh, for each stone. Now, here's a stone in the proximal ureter. And one of the things I really like about this, as I talked about earlier, was the lack of retropulsion using this laser. The stone doesn't fly up very much and it really just wants to dust very, very well. I found this to be very efficient at dusting and I, for instance, had a two centimeter stone in a patient who could not undergo PCNL. And I booked the room for about two and a half hours because that's how long it's normally taken me for such large stones. And when I got in there and finished it, we basically finished in about an hour and 10 minutes for the entire room time. And there was only about 26 minutes of, of actual laser time. So it's very, very efficient and uh, very fast and very safe. The one thing I like about this is you can basically turn it down so the stone doesn't move, but that the stone still, still fragments. And once you get it into a calyx, you can actually see that the stone is still breaking up very, very nicely. You can find that with pop dusting, it breaks up really, really well. And all you need to do is sit the fiber in the middle of a calyx, and then it will break up really nicely. Now you'll see here, that I've actually hit the back of the calyx accidentally. And this often happens even with homium YAG laser. And when that does happen, you'll often find that you'll get some bleeding. But with the saltive laser, it actually, because of the wavelength, it actually coagulates very nicely and you don't get bleeding. Where with the homium YAG laser, if you do get some bleeding during your case, it can actually affect everything. And then it's very difficult to see and your chip on your scope gets saturated and it can often be difficult to finish the case. And you can see here, there's very, very fine silt and very fine dust. Now, what has changed from this is if we look at a homium YAG laser, I mean, we have whole courses and whole hands-on things where we do this essentially to teach people how to do these fine little tips and tricks on how to maneuver our ureter scope to dust. So you gotta work from the edge towards the middle. If you just go right for the middle of the stone, you're gonna have large fragments flying around. It's gonna be quite difficult to get to. And you know, we teach our residents that you need to have your main hand on, on, on the main scope and then your other hand doing fine manipulations. You have to keep the fiber slightly off the stone so that it dusts better. There's all these things that you have to keep in mind. Whereas I find that with the salt of laser, we don't need to do and learn these little tips and tricks uh, to avoid producing large fragments, that essentially we don't need to learn how to do this kind of fine manipulation, that if you just sit there in a calyx and pop dust, it actually works really well. So I've actually changed my technique with the salt of laser. And I found that junior residents who are fairly new to ureteroscopy do very, very well with the salt of laser. So in fact, I worry about them a little bit because when they do go to home EMEAG laser, it's actually a little bit different. And I think that their stone fee rates may not be as good and I have to teach them all these other techniques. So when you do look at this, uh, it really just dusts very, very finely and it dusts very small stones very well and very soft stones very well, but even the hard stones, it will deal very well as well too. So this stone was starting to move around a little bit. So I actually had to turn down the frequency a little bit from 400 hertz to 100 hertz and I found that the stone didn't move around as much yet it still continues to fragment. This is one thing I find that with home YMEAG laser that I was always trying to turn down the laser energy low enough so the stone wouldn't move but balancing that with ensuring that there was enough energy to fragment the stone particularly dusting. 
And to end our session, we will hear a recording from Mr. Bodo Knudsen, who's a consultant endourologist at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, USA. Bodo will discuss Saltive and its capabilities for mini PCNL. All right, I'm going to do my presentation on mini PCNL with the Saltive Super Pulse Thulium Fiber Laser. I'm uh, Bodo Knudsen, uh, the director of the OSU Comprehensive Kidney Stone Program uh, at the Ohio State University in Columbus, uh, Ohio. I have uh, disclosures in that I'm a consultant for both Boston Scientific and Olympus Surgical. So mini PCNL allows for treatment of larger volume stones in a less invasive manner than traditional full-size PCNL. The smaller tract size reduces morbidity, such as bleeding, and permits uh, enhanced recovery after the procedure. The supine position provides ergonomic benefits to the surgeon and facilitates the venturi effect of clearing fragments during the mini PCNL. The introduction of the Soltave Super Pulse Thulium Fiber Laser may enhance this procedure further and ultimately lead to broadening of its indications. So briefly, I'll just talk a little bit about the position that we use for the procedure. Uh, we position the patient supine and then we place a gel roll under the buttocks and then a slightly larger gel roll under the shoulder. We do bring the arm across the patient and secure it with some padding and tape. The contralateral leg is placed in a stirrup um, to secure it and the ipsilateral leg is left straight. And this allows us to kind of keep the hip angle open. An arm board is used for the lower arm and you can see that on this picture and it's padded. And this allows us to bring the C-arm in safely without hitting the arm. Here you can see how the legs are positioned. We do often place scopes uh, from below up into the kidney uh, for ESERS procedures, so this allows easy access to the urethra. Here's our basic table setup. Uh, we use a couple of different wires, usually an angle tip wire and a super stiff wire. Uh, you can see our mini uh, nephroscope with the dilators, uh, a flexible scope if we need it and some other standard surgical instruments. You can also see on this table that we have some tubing. Um, that is for use with our uh, fluid irrigation system. And then we use marking with epinephrine in the tract to reduce any bleeding. A tipless nitinol basket can also be helpful uh, for stones that are difficult to clear just with the venturi effect alone. This is our pressure uh, irrigation system that we use. This is uh, a thermetic system. It allows for warming of the fluid during the procedure, but most importantly, it allows for consistent flow of fluid, which is very important for mini PCNL. Two large bags can be connected to the system, and as the bags begin to run low, an alarm goes off alerting the staff in the OR that they must change them. Fluid deficit can also be recorded if need be with the system, but we typically don't use the, um, that feature. We use the MIP system uh, for the actual surgery. This is a reusable system that is an entire um, uh, system for mini PCNL. It includes dilators, sheaths, and the scope itself. The dilators come in different sizes, and we typically use 16.5 for the dilator and 17.5 French for the sheath. If there's a very large stone burden, we may use the 21-22 combination, and occasionally when we're placing second tracks, we'll use the smaller 15-16. The nephroscope is 12 French and works well with um, smaller instruments, such as the stone basket and the laser fiber. The main purpose though of this system is to allow the venturi effect to allow fragments to wash out during the procedure. So this video is showing a stone in the lower pole that was um, treated with a mini PCNL approach. Here a puncture was made directly into the lower pole 
and then the thulium fiber laser was used to break up the pieces and clear them. This patient also had additional stone in the kidney, uh, but the first stone that we cleared was the lower pole part. Here the soltive worked extremely well to quickly fragment it and wash out the pieces. The mini PCNL approach allows for ESERS, where we place a ureteroscope up in a retrograde fashion. Here we can see we're looking into the kidney with the mini nephroscope, and then the ureteroscope is being passed uh, below by one of the surgical assistants. A stone in a parallel calyx is found and pulled back into the renal pelvis. Now we can get at it with the mini nephroscope and remove it. Here the thulium fiber is brought in to make the stone smaller so it'll fit through our mini PCNL sheath. You can see with the thulium fiber that the pieces that are created are very small and actually wash out during the laser. So here's another case. Um, this is a 29 year old patient with a stone that was over three centimeters in size and 1200 Hounsfield units. Typically not one that often mini PCNL would be considered on. The patient also had a high BMI of 48.8. However, with the uh, addition of the thulium fiber laser, we felt that this was a reasonable stone to try and treat with a mini PCNL approach. So here's the endoscopic view during this case. So we were able to establish our access and get to the stone, and again, use the thulium fiber laser to break it up. Despite the stone being very large and very hard, it broke up nicely. And you can see very consistent small fragments break off from the stone during the lasering of it. And this is one of the things as our experience increased with the thulium fiber laser that we noticed that there's much more consistency in fragment size as compared to the homium laser. So there's some pieces breaking off and we quickly are able to wash them out. The entire stone took 24 minutes of laser time. So it still took some work to get this broken up, but certainly reasonable for something that's over three centimeters in size um, being handled with a mini track. The fiber will burn back some while you laser, but we did not have to strip the fiber during the procedure. It still worked well, even as it burned back. And here you can also see the advantage of having that consistent fluid system running. We didn't run out of fluid during the lasering of this. And by having that consistent flow, a lot of the small fragments and dust are actually clearing out as we laser this stone. Here you can see there's a little bit of a larger piece that broke off, um, a little bit too big to fit through the sheath. So we just simply laser it further, breaking off pieces that come out. As you systematically work through this, the stone's gonna get smaller and eventually you're going to get to the back side of it. Here you can see now there's only a few pieces left. Same principle, continue to wash them out as you laser. And what was interesting at the end, there wasn't a whole bunch of rubble to deal with. The pieces really had all come out during the process. So that's a great way to, to speed things up with these procedures. At the completion of our mini PCNL, we closed the incision with an absorbable suture placed under the skin. We almost never leave a nephrostomy tube. Typically, we'll only leave a nephrostomy tube if we think we need to go back in. We will consider leaving a stent if there's a lot of edema at the UPJ or if there's some bleeding, or many cases now we'll do totally tubeless. However, if we do stent them, we leave the stent on a string coming out through the urethra. 
And in the vast majority of patients, we take the string out the following morning before the patient goes home. That way they're discharged from the hospital without a nephrostomy tube and without a stent. And I think that's a real benefit of the mini PCNL procedure. And these are not inpatient stays in our setting. They are considered observation 23 hour stays. So mini PCNL is a highly effective way for treating renal stones in a minimally invasive fashion with less morbidity than standard uh, PCNL and enhanced recovery. The Soltiv Superpulse Thulium Fiber Laser System is a great addition to mini PCNL with its ability to very rapidly but also consistently break up stones. We think that potentially this is going to lead to uh, an expansion of the indications for mini PCNL in the future. Thank you.